able legacy hardware. So yeah, yeah we'll be really keen to see some possible solutions. Thanks, Duncan. What do I use to click the thing over? You use the mouse. Okay, so my name's Duncan Garmans Wayne. I currently work for the police as an analyst in the road policing support team. So uh, most of my work is to do with speed cameras. Um, my colleagues deal with things like alcohol and crashing and that sort of thing. Um, I also have been studying part-time at VIC, um, undergrad statistics papers. And in the past I've worked for the New Zealand Defence Force and the Ministry of Justice. So. I've had a little bit of experience with completely out-of-date IT hardware. Um, one of the things I, I wish I'd known ages ago, I just discovered recently, is that if you want to manage quite a large data set without installing any fancy software, um, without needing a big fancy computer, without needing any IT support, all you have to do is save as .xnsx. No, that's a complete joke. Um, <laughs> There's not many, um, the, the restrictive IT environment I'm going to talk about is uh, not really conducive to handling large data sets well. So the solution that I'll present is handling large data sets extremely badly. In fact, the worst possible way, it brings you to the level of possible rather than impossible. Um, because um, I... I don't think I can really give a tutorial about the three packages I'm going to use in 20 minutes. So I'll mainly be trying to just dispel any hope you may have that it's going to be that easy. But it will be possible. The three packages I use uh, to, to spoil the end of the talk are FF, FF Base, which um, manage large data sets by loading them into memory in small manageable chunks, and LAF, which uh, reads data into memory quite quickly and in, uh, interacts with the first two packages. So it's probably clear by now that I'm talking about large data sets as in there's a lot of it rather than it's coming in really fast or that there's a lot of variety. The reason for that is that I think the other two definitions you can plan for and they come with a budget. You know when you're going to get a lot of data in very fast or you know when it's going to be very complex but you don't necessarily know when it's going to be very large. My particular problem is that I might do a piece of analysis, for example, on lowered speed tolerances at holiday weekends, and all the holiday weekends we've had so far just about fit into memory. But then my boss said, oh, that's really great. Can you do it for the whole of the last five years? Mm. Oh, well, not really. Um, another way to really quickly run out of memory is to add a new column to your data set. And an even better way is to fit a linear model to it, because if you're not careful, it'll make a complete copy of all your data. And that's what happens. We don't have to feel bad about it, because R is not the only programming language that, that processes data in memory. I managed to do the same thing in Python. I'm not an expert in Python, but it shows that a non-expert can get into real trouble real fast. If anyone's not heard of Julia, Julia is a relatively new programming language primarily aimed at scientists. It promises a lot, particularly speed, but it's still going to run out of memory because memory is a physical problem with a computer. It's not a software problem. This is my restrictive IT environment. At police, we're still on Windows XP which is a 32-bit operating system. So even if my superintendent would buy me 64 gigabytes of RAM, there's no way I could use it. Another thing I can't do is one of the better ways of managing large data sets, which is to use databases. Databases are really good at managing large data sets, as long as they can compute the kind of statistics that you want. And seeing as I mainly just count things, um, databases can do that but I don't have the permissions to install anything and IT. The absolute best way to deal with a large data set is to upload it to a powerful computer in the cloud like the Amazon EC2 service, um, but we have privacy concerns. Just to talk a bit about the physical aspect of it, 
I like to think of um, disk memory as a textbook. It stores a lot of information. It's very high capacity. Paper is cheap. But to process it, it's really slow. Unfortunately, the world isn't very interested in making disk uh, data access much faster. So the world is moving towards having an awful lot of RAM, which I like to think of as a brain. It's very forgetful. If you turn off your computer, it forgets everything. You have to load the data back in. And it's very expensive. Um, but it's, it processes information at very high speed. Um, what's my next slide? One of the companies that's going this way that used to process everything, as I understand it, on disk is SAS. I think SPS is, S is the same. SAS has two new products, Visual Statistics and Visual Analytics, which um, are in-memory statistics engines. What they're really selling you is a very expensive piece of hardware called a laser server which just has a whole lot of memory. So they've gone down the hardware route of solving this problem in order to catch up with R, which has always been there, a bit ahead of the curve. I'm about to show you an actual curve with far too much text on it for a PowerPoint slide, but I couldn't get rid of the text easily. So if you just concentrate on the curve, uh, many of you may have seen this before. It's quite cool. The Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies. It's a good uh, yardstick for whether or not you should invest time in learning a new technology. Um, reading from the left, you've got the innovation trigger. So say Star Trek has features a computer that responds to speech recognition. And everybody goes, that's cool, but it doesn't exist. And then when it does exist, they produce the first speech recognition engine for a desktop computer. People get way overexcited about it. They realize that they can open word with a command spoken to the computer. And then they try to write a memo to their boss, and all they get is a string of expletives, and they hit the trough of disillusionment. This isn't actually going to work. Or maybe it is working. Eventually, and according to this diagram, we've reached it. Speech recognition has reached the plateau of productivity. So we can use it quite well for doing things like Google searches. We can use it to make videos text searchable by automatically converting the audio into text. It's not great for reading, but it's good for those particular applications. In-memory analytics, which is what R does, is on the slope of enlightenment, and they predict it will reach the plateau of productivity, whatever that is, in two years. So that's why the world is moving in this direction and is not really interested in solving a particular problem that I have, which is that I don't have a lot of memory. So what's the worst possible solution? It's to break up data into bite-sized chunks. I couldn't resist this photo. This is a python eating an alligator in one gulp. That's sometimes what my day-to-day -day work feels like. Don't do that. Use one of the amazing packages that's available, FF, FFBase, and LAF. It sounds relatively simple to just load a bit of the data in at the time. We're used to that, for example, when sampling. Unfortunately, sampling doesn't work in this use case because I need to count how many things actually happened, not get a statistic for an average of how many things are happening. However, if you use a package, it does things that you might not have thought about. There's an overhead associated with each little chunk of data that you load into memory. So an easy way to do it would be to just load in one row at a time, but that would be a very slow way of doing it. It's fastest with the bigger the chunk you can get away with, but if you want your code to run on somebody else's computer, you've got to know how big a chunk their computer can handle in one go. FF works that out for you. You can manipulate it. You can tell it how big a chunk you want. But it's much easier just to let it work it out for itself. Um, another problem you run into when using chunks of data is computing statistics. Because if you think about how you might compute a standard deviation, you would probably have to load, go through the whole data set at least twice 
to get all the information you need to compute it. Not only would that take a bit of code, but there, are, there seem to be better algorithms for that sort of thing. And a few of them are implemented in the FF base package, which um, makes it possible to do most of the ordinary sort of statistics you would do on a data set. And if you can come up with any really clever ways of fitting your favorite model, because it's open source, you could contribute it to the package and it will only get better. Finally, the LAF package answers a problem which you might already be solving using the fread command in data.table. The fread command has developed an MVVL reputation for loading data really, really fast, but it only works on comma-separated values, CSV files, so it doesn't work on fixed-width files, and it doesn't load data in chunks. There is a bug report for that, but it's something to do with text connections or something. The LAF package loads data in chunks. It can load data a column at a time, which is very handy, because often you find that although your data set doesn't fit into memory, the particular column you need does. And finally, there's a function in the um, FF base package, which loads data from the using LAF straight into what's called an FF object, which is how you interact with uh, data in chunks. Uh, a final trick with these packages is that you can actually save data in a very efficient binary format, which makes it incredibly small. How am I doing? Yeah, no, no, you're fantastic. I said I wasn't going to give a tutorial, so I'll put up another slide that's got too many words on it, but when it goes on the website, you'll be able to read it. It's a good warning for um, how, you, how, you, how your code's going to look. These packages do do a bit of magic, but they don't make your code magically easier to write. This is the command just for reading data in, and in fact, in real life, it's going to look a lot worse because most of the arguments you need take lists. I think the ones I use are about this long. Here's another one. Big warning, if you use the f -f -d -f -d apply command, read the documentation. It could upset you. I actually use this. The um, holiday weekends when we lower our speed tolerance, what we're trying to do is lower the not the tolerance, but lower the speed of vehicles. Um, I used this to analyze 7 million rows of data. It's not much, but it's enough to beat my work computer. Um, and I'm going to be using it again uh, with the new campaign and with the new speed cameras that we're installing. There's one beautiful thing. This is my work stream. Unbelievably, our old speed cameras still load the data onto floppy disks. <laughs> We import that into SAP business objects, which is very powerful. It could do pretty much all I want it to do, except that I don't have programmatic access to it, IT permissions. So I download it into a CSV format. I use the LAF package to read it into R, and I save it in a very efficient binary format using the FF and FFBest packages. Thanks to these people for developing the amazing packages. How am I doing for time? Perfect. Spot on. Yes. There are a few other slides which um, will be online later. They describe slightly better alternatives. If you can install a database, then SQLite is quite good. If you can install a database with permission, uh, MonoDB is even better because it's very fast for doing analytical type things like creating new columns and doing aggregations. Um, don't be put off. MonoDB by the highest voted Stack Overflow question, which is, does anybody use it in production? It doesn't seem to be actively developed. It definitely is actively developed. And one of the new features this month was R integration so that you can use R from within the Monet database. And yes, it's incredibly fast. Thank it's you, on my wish list. <laughs>
Thank you very much for listening. Um, have you had any, would it be possible for you to just buy a new computer and use that air gap from everything else? Um, that's what I do at home, but a better solution is to hire somebody else's computer um, and run that in the cloud. But the cloud, you're having issues with yeah. privacy? I um, would love to have a bigger computer at work, and that would certainly be much cheaper than paying me to spend hours programming. Uh, but that's a really difficult argument to make when you're on the bottom of the ladder. But it's a good suggestion. Any other questions? Yeah, I Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's a very good question. The question was what kind of analytics do I do with the data once I've got it into R? Yeah. A lot of it is counting things. One of the things I did, which is um, hard to do if you're doing it in Excel, is count the, it is figure out the lag between one vehicle and the next. The reason we wanted to do that is um, to control for heavy traffic. So if a car is traveling in a queue of traffic, it's the driver isn't free to speed if they want to. Um, so that's one of the things we controlled for. I did also fit a couple of fairly simple models, um, which my colleague couldn't fit in SPSS, and he was using SPSS at, at home on his home computer, crunching through a lot of data overnight. So fairly basic stuff. You use the information, if you're allowed to say. Have we used the information yes. uh, um, to inform policy decisions mainly? Yes. Um, are you asking like about privacy or no, enforcement no, really. or anything? Yes, yes. In terms of enforcement, it's no. Problem. I mean, the camera, the camera issues a ticket, or it doesn't. Well, the camera doesn't issue a ticket. The camera right. takes a photo. Um, we have a processing unit who read every photo mm. and they issue the tickets. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a human process to look at a photo and judge other things about the situation and choose to issue a ticket or not? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the cameras record everything that they think is a vehicle and that's the survey data that I'm looking at to do things like mean speeds. Um, yeah, see if people have slowed down when we've installed a new camera, that sort of thing but issuing a ticket is a human and rather expensive process. So what's the privacy issue with cloud computing given that you just said your colleague can take the data presumably on a USB stick to his house? house? Um, that's encrypted. And I don't know how I could encrypt this to work on it in the cloud. You mean, so the USB stick is encrypted? Yeah and you don't know how you could upload an, an encrypted file to the cloud? Uh, yes, but once it was in the cloud, I would have to decrypt it in the cloud as well. People are scared of the internet. Oh, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. that um, uh, cloud fear. Um, I mean, so uh, think about AWS, for example, they have quite an interest in, in security, yeah. given that if they were hacked, they would so it's clearly not a, it's clearly not a we can't take it out of the environment issue at police. It's where it goes in someone's laptop in their own house, which they could leave on a train or yeah. it's, it's safer in that estimation. Yeah. Doing things through the internet. It's a common yeah. thing. It's just usually usually both of them are a problem. Like you can't take it out. Uh, on a USB key, and you can't use the cloud. Yeah. yeah. If you have any solutions to the encryption cloud problem, I would love to see you talk about them. Because, okay. uh, yeah, this is a big problem for me. And would it probably if, you could, if you could credibly solve that problem, do you think you'd be allowed to put this data? Because there are obviously other 
concerns and that many of the better value cloud resources are not located within New Zealand. Um, but this is not, is it individual level data? I mean, do, do you care about the number plate? Have you, is that a column in your? No, it doesn't capture the number. Right. So basically the data is really de-identified. So what is location? Um, I'm not an expert in privacy, but I know it's more complicated than most bungling public servants think it's going to be. <laughs> so I guess I'm also, cla I've got clam fear. Yeah. Anything else? Do you feel like, do you know many other people in your domain or other um, people in other domains that are actually confronted with exactly the same problems they were from? Old hardware and they just need these kind of packages to deal with the data, or do you think it's a very specific niche? No, it's well, it's in three government departments I've worked in, at least. Yeah, I mean, I expect it's probably quite widespread. I don't know, maybe we could have a show of hands for people who've got weak hardware in their job. <laughs> and if it's not, if it's not <laughs> this particular kind of problem with R, then it's some kind of problem with the tools not being the best for the job, I think most everyone has that. Yeah. That issue. This is a specific instantiation, which is particularly troubling. XP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Anyone else who has a question? All right. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So we take a five minutes break. Okay, and we're also got, got a change of room. Uh, we're moving into the to, to the room next door. Okay. We finally got the IT to work. So, uh, yeah, we'll pick everything and move it.